السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على النبي الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسل لي أمري وحل لقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم لا سهل إلا ما جعلته سهلا وأنت تجعل الحزن إذا شئت سهلا برحمتك يا رحم الرحيمين Dear brothers and sisters, uh, inshallah, today I'll be discussing on the regulatory institutions related to the conventional and Islamic wealth management. Uh, as you know, uh, regulation is quite important for, uh, in the field of uh, Islamic wealth management, both Islamic and conventional wealth management. This is an industry that requires a lot of trust uh, from the investors. Uh, and especially after the financial crisis in 2008, where there are a lot of um, uh, bankruptcies and also uh, failures of investment banks, the investors have lost uh, their trust on uh, private banking as well as on the Islamic wealth management industry. So after that, there was uh, enhanced uh, regulation. So. Today, I'll be talking on the three important uh, regulators in the, con uh, which in the context of Malaysia. So I'll be talking about uh, Bank Negara Malaysia, which is the regulatory institution for uh, banks, uh, Islamic banks, investment banks, takaful, uh, as well as uh, financial advisors. And then I'll be talking on uh, Securities Commission Malaysia, which is the uh, statutory body for to to regulate uh, securities uh, and also uh, related uh, institutions and firms and also i'll be talking about uh, talking on a lab one financial services authority which is uh, uh, i can say kind of an offshore uh, business uh, which provide the offshore business facility in lab one in the island of lab one so uh, if you look into the, the regulatory institutions for wealth management as well as any financial institutions in Malaysia, it comes under either one of these two. Either it's under the Bank Negara Malaysia, which is the central bank of the country, and or, um, it goes to, or it may go to under uh, Securities Commission Malaysia, which is in, in charge of uh, regulating uh, the securities, uh, uh, the shares, bonds, and also the companies which are involved in issuing the shares and uh, sukuk, uh, as well as uh, even the derivatives instruments. So let me talk on the first, the Bank Negara or the Central Bank. But before I talk about on Bank Negara, let me explain to you a background of the Central Bank. So the concept of this uh, central bank, uh, it was uh, first, uh, it uh, uh, was uh, st established first in the Europe in the 17th century, uh, and the Bank of England was argued to be the first model on which the modern central banks have been based. So usually the central bank used to be at the beginning as the uh, bank to raise funds for the government. So it was the bank for the government to raise funds and also to spend for on behalf of the government. The, over the time, the most central banks were granted the right of issuing notes, I mean currencies, the, the notes, allowing them to reap the profits and to overcome the problems from unregulated issue of notes by individual banks. Well, in the past, the banks used to uh, issue their notes or their checks uh, that uh, used to be considered as a kind of uh, money or currency. But as that created problem, then the central bank uh, appeared emerged as the sole issuer of the currency so that there is no uh, speculation as well as an issue uh, uh, in the in a certain jurisdiction in terms of circulating the uh, currencies. Later, the commercial banks became the instruments to central banks for managing liquidity in the financial system. So when 
uh, the capitalist system uh, uh, became uh, established and uh, the, the paper currency was uh, was there so at that time uh, the, the central bank also had a role to also to to manage the the financial stability as well as uh, the circulation of the money and the liquidity uh, uh, in the financial system so there was a uh, uh, monitoring and regulation by the central bank on the commercial bank to monitor their uh, liquidity uh, for the stability of the financial system and then in 1944, uh, when the Britain uh, Agreement, uh, okay, based on the, the Britain Woods Agreement, uh, it required the governments and central banks to implement monetary policy, uh, which further strengthened the role of central banks. So, after, so from this, uh, the Britain Wood Agreement, and from that on, the, the, pap the paper currency or the fiat money was uh no, was started so from that on the central bank also um, uh, was required to uh, implement the monetary policy which is uh, which is uh, the monetary policy is uh, to decide uh, uh, the circulation of money or currency in an economy uh, either to uh, to to have uh, you know to increase or decrease the the supply of the money so current days, uh, the central bank is grant, uh, granted a special authority to issue the country's currency. So now uh, every country, uh, the central bank will, uh, uh, will issue its currency, which is its official currency. The central bank also plays a role to safeguard the, the value of currency issued. And this can be achieved through a stable monetary policy. So when um, uh, the paper currency uh, is issued, so uh, a country's, um, uh, the, the value of that currency is based on supply and demand. So when uh, the value of the currency is based on supply and demand, so the central bank has a lot of duty to, to make sure uh, there is a sufficient amount of currency so the, uh, and there is no oversupply of currency and also there is also no less supply of the currency so that the, the economy, uh, the price of the thing is stable, the financial system is, is stable. At the same time, the central bank also should be institutionally independent from political interference. So it is very important uh, for the central bank of any country to be free from any political interference so that uh, the government uh, cannot interfere on the, on the supply of money. And we have learned uh, that previously in some countries where uh, the central bank was uh, has issued uh, currency responsibly so at the end uh, like uh, in the case of Zimbabwe uh, it happened that the, the currency uh, was uh, was uh, was uh, the it was required to abandon the currency because they they were responsible uh, where a trillion uh, dollar uh, with a trillion uh, uh, Zimbabwean uh, uh, dollar even you cannot uh, someone cannot be uh, was not able to buy uh, a cup of tea so uh, that was uh, because of the the uh, political influence and big uh, and uh, the irresponsible uh, printing of, of money so uh, the central uh, in order for the economy uh, to move uh, free the circulation of the currency should uh, should uh, move free based on supply and demand. It should be free from uh, political interference as well as uh, there should be a, um, a good organizational structure that will ensure that uh, the, uh, the, the monetary policy decisions are taken based on uh, uh, based on discussions, uh, based on uh, discussion with uh, the members, uh, is, uh, as well as there is transparency on the uh, on the on the decisions taken. So now come to the uh, bank, central bank of Malaysia, which is called the Bank Negara Malaysia. 
it was established in 1959 of 26 January uh, as the Central Bank of Malaysia so it is a statutory body uh, so it is um, uh, um, uh, what we call a statutory body which is a separate uh, the entity uh, uh, is a separate uh, organization uh, and it, uh, it is governed uh, by the Central Bank Act. So right now it is governed under the Central Bank Act 2009 uh, which is, uh, actually the, there was another Central Bank Act which was uh, 1950 uh, if I'm not mistaken around 1950s and then there was a revised Central Bank Act in 2009. Right now uh, Tan Sri Nur Shamsia is the, um, uh, is the current governor of uh, Bank Negara Malaysia and uh, the role of Bank Negara is uh, Malaysia is to promote monetary and financial uh, stability. So it will supervise, uh, uh, it will issue the currency uh, as well, uh, and it will uh, ensure that the financial system uh, the fi uh, in the country is stable. The price of the uh, item, uh, the things uh, are, are kept uh, uh, stable. Uh, so this is uh, mainly their, their job. Uh, Bank Negara Malaysia has played a significant uh, development role in developing the financial system infrastructure. As we look into the history of uh, Malaysia, we can see the Bank Negara has played a very important role on developing the financial infrastructure in Malaysia, especially the development of Islamic finance. It has uh, developed like um, some international organizations as well as uh, uh, there are good, proper regulation as well as uh, the human resource management uh, like uh, in ISRA and INSEF uh, uh, is, are being established by Bank Negara is, as, uh, to, to facilitate uh, the, the development of human resource uh, in, is in the field of Islamic finance. So, uh, so what are exactly the roles and functions of Bank Negara Malaysia? So these are the the the, uh, the four or uh, five roles uh, that uh, we can uh, summarize uh, from uh, their uh, website, okay, or from the Central Bank Act. Uh, first, it is a banker and advisor to the government, so that the Central Bank uh, will keep the account of the government and it will collect the tax as well as it will also uh, spend uh, money where required on behalf of the government. So they are the banker as well as it is the advisor to the, to the uh, government. It will advise uh, related to certain financial affairs. Uh, it will advise the government on taking policy. Secondly, it is uh, also is the role of the Bank Negara to have a prudent uh, conduct of monetary policy. So monetary policy uh, is the policy related to the supply of money, the circulation of currency in an economy. Uh, whether um, uh, it relates to the interest rate or we can say that the profit rate, uh, whether how easy it will be uh, for people to, to have money, it's also related to the reserve requirement uh, in every bank, uh, as well as the, the issu uh, issuance of securities through the interbank money market. Uh, so the monetary policy are taken in order to uh, sometimes uh, to to keep the inflation rate into minimum. Okay, sometimes uh, to to target uh, the economic development, uh, infrastructure uh, development. So and to or sometimes to uh, 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 to make sure uh, it is easy for people to borrow money. And then. Uh, uh, there another role is the financial system stability. So it is very important, especially in this uh, age of technology and where there are a lot of uh, spam cases. So uh, it is uh, the role of the uh, Bank Negara Malaysia to ensure that the transfer of money as well as uh, 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 keeping money in the bank is everything is safe. The financial system is safe while people doing transactions through it uh, and the banks um, as well as all the financial institutions, they are properly regulated uh, so that there is no bank run. 
uh, there is uh, supervision, there is no even the violation of Sharia in terms of Islamic banking principles. So the system is, is, uh, is, uh, is uh, stable. Also, uh, the role of Bank Negara is to, devel uh, to play the development roles. So it also uh, play a very important role uh, to, to ensure that uh, the, uh, the infrastructure are developed. It plays, for example, the, the financial situation of the people improve. For example, it also provides uh, counseling, financial education to, to people uh, in order for them to improve their financial uh, uh, situation. Uh, it also uh, develops certain institution, uh, some certain infrastructure in order for to educate the people as well as uh, to develop uh, the finance. Especially we can see the development of Islamic finance in Malaysia. Uh, the law of infrastructure have been uh, developed uh, and initiatives have been taken by the central bank. And finally, uh, financial inclusion. The Bank Negara's role is to make sure that uh, all the people, all the citizens uh, of Malaysia, they are uh, included uh, in the financial system, that they can get financial services easily, it is available to them. There is no, no one, uh, there is no, uh, there should, uh, there, there should not be any community or, uh, who are excluded from the financial services and they also do research on that and they take necessary measurements uh, and they come out with uh, rules and regulation uh, to ensure that uh, there is uh, uh, the f uh, financial inclusion of all communities uh, in the country. So while well, talking about this uh, monetary policy, so I, I think it is uh, needed to be discussed uh, a bit more detail. So this uh, monetary uh, policy as a regulator, the central bank must ensure the market stability in the country's financial system. For that purpose, one of their approaches is to transmit their monetary policy through money market. The central bank can influence the liquidity level and short-term interest rates in the domestic financial system. So it is uh, in order to keep the system uh, stable, uh, the central bank must have some monetary policies. For example, liquidity is very important for the financial institutions. If it is like the blood uh, in human uh, human being, so if there is no liquidity uh, for uh, for um, and if the financial institutions, if they need any liquidity, uh, and if they cannot fulfill their liquidity, they can just uh, go bankrupt or they may have bank run. So it is the uh, role of the central bank to take necessary policy so that there's uh, liquidity for the financial institutions as well as uh, in order to make sure that uh, the financial system is safe uh, in, in uh, for, uh, there's no, uh, no, there's not much uh, currency that may lead to uh, uh, in too much inflation in the in the economy. So that's the the, the role uh, of the central bank to take the proper monetary policy or use the proper instrument in order to, uh, for example, to to mitigate uh, the inflation or also uh, in order to sometime to have a proper li uh, to liquidity. Uh, so that is the, the role of uh, the central bank to monitor in terms of monetary policy. So there are usually three types of instruments that the central bank will use uh, to, um, uh, to, uh, as a monetary uh, policy instrument. One is the open market operations, a discount rate, another one is the reserve requirement. So open market operation is uh, is actually when the government will buy, uh, when the government will uh, uh, issue or uh, when the government will uh, buy back the securities uh, in order to um, in order to tackle the supply of money. So when the government wants to uh, take out uh, the money from economy, why it is needed when the government thinks that there is a excessive um, cash in the economy, means currency in the economy and there's inflation. So the central bank wants to 
uh, take out the currency from the economy. So uh, one of the way uh, to take out the, the currency from the economy uh, is, uh, is through issuing the securities. When the central bank will issue uh, securities, so people, um, uh, so people will uh, buy, the financial institutions will buy the security and then they will pay to the central bank. So the central bank will, through this way, will take out the money, the currency from the economy. At the and then uh, when the central bank wants to uh, pump in uh, currency money in the economy when uh, the economy needs to have uh, some uh, more currency, needs to have inflation so that uh, and need to have liquidity uh, so that uh, the businesses uh, can grow, can uh, can move on. Uh, so at that time, uh, the, cent uh, the central bank will sell off the security. Mm, the central bank will uh, the sell. Uh, uh, of this uh, security means that uh, the financial institutions and other institutions, uh, um, okay, they will get paid. Uh, okay, the cent uh, means the central bank will uh, buy back uh, the the securities that uh, the central bank issued. Uh, so they will buy back. The central bank will pay them by currency. So the currency entered the the economy. So this is one of the. Uh, instrument, uh, 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 monetary policy instrument, which is called open market operation. And the second instrument is the discount rate, which is actually the interest rate. So when the central bank wants to, um, let's say, target to, uh, again, to decrease the supply of money, uh, so it can just increase the uh, interest rate. So when the interest rate is increased, so it will uh, be difficult for uh, for uh, for the customers of our financial institutions to to borrow. The cost of borrowing will be higher, so it will have a lot of consequences. Uh, so one of them is uh, to uh, to curve uh, the the inflation. But at the same time, when the central bank wants to increase the supply of money, then it can again reduce the. Uh, the lab, uh, it can again uh, reduce the uh, the interest rate. Uh, so same with the uh, so this uh, interest rate. Of course, it is not uh, Sharia compliant, uh, but for, um, because it is riba. Uh, however, Islamic uh, for in in Malaysia there uh, uh, they have uh, Islamic interbank rates or profit rate that uh, replaces uh, the uh, the conventional uh, rate. That's so usually call it uh, OP, uh, the overnight uh, policy rate. Same with the uh, open market operations. Uh, so if uh, the instrument, uh, the the securities that banks use, if they use the conventional securities, it are not Sharia compliant. One of the securities, like uh, the tr uh, the treasury bills or the T bills, okay, which is the most uh, liquid bond where the government promised to uh, the pay interest. So uh, these are the instruments are not Sharia compliant because they pay interest. However, there are alternative uh, Sharia compliant in, uh, uh, instrument like in Malaysia, the interbank money market, Islamic interbank money market, there, there are some uh, Islamic uh, instruments. So there is Islamic uh, T-bills or treasury bills, there is uh, uh, government uh, Islamic uh, investment issue, government investment issue based on Sharia and also Mudaraba interbank investment. So these are Sharia compliant uh, uh, um, securities that can be used for open market operations by the central bank. And the third one is the reserve requirement. Uh, okay, uh, so the central bank also requires the financial institution to keep some reserve uh, uh, to money as in their uh, in their bank, uh, in uh, because. Um, during the we have the fractional reserve banking system where uh, when uh, the financial institutions they get uh, deposits uh, from the customers uh, so they are they just require to keep a some amount of uh, money as reserve and then uh, for example right now it is uh, 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 for uh, like eight eight percent. So, so they need to keep 8%, like based on the, the, the Basel Committee's uh, uh, requirement. It's 8% they need to keep uh, as, uh, as a reserve, and then the rest they can 
uh, uh, give a loan or financing to others. So central bank has uh, different types of uh, uh, reserve requirement that uh, the uh, financial institution should keep. Like one of the in is uh, capital adequacy ratio that the minimum uh, like at least 8% uh, uh, the, uh, the financial institutions uh, they require to keep. Uh, at the same time, there is also a liquidity reserve requirement that statutory liquidity reserve requirement well, which uh, the, cent uh, the financial institutions uh, are required to keep with the central bank, means Bank Negara Malaysia. Uh, so if the Bank Negara wants to increase the supply of money, it can uh, reduce uh, the, the rate of the uh, uh, statutory uh, liquidity reserve requirement. But if, once, if the Bank Negara wants to increase the supply of money, so it can increase the, uh, the rate for statutory reserve requirement for the financial institutions. And uh, so this is the one of the way uh, to implement the monetary policy. And uh, this monetary policy is in line with the Sharia. There is no issue on that. Um, however, in case of Islamic finance, uh, it is Islamic financial institutions are required to keep higher reserve comparing with the uh, uh, conventional uh, financial institutions because uh, their uh, financing uh, got higher risk, the, uh, higher risk comparing with the conventional. So these are the acts uh, um, that's uh, also sub uh, that's. Uh, this uh, describes Bank Negara's roles and functions. The first uh, and for the most important one is the Central Bank of Malaysia Act 2009, actually which was replaced uh, by uh, Central, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, um, this. Uh, before this, there was Central Bank of Malaysia Act 1958. So that one was replaced by the act in 2009 as well as there is a financial services act covering uh, financial institution conventional financial institutions and there is islamic financial services act ipsa 2013 this is a comprehensive law for the operation uh, supervision and control of islamic financial institutions also there is uh, as well, uh, there is insurance act 1996 Development Financial Institutions Act uh, 2002. So this is an act to regulate and supervise the development financial institutions in Malaysia, like uh, uh, Agrobank, uh, Bank Rakyat, and others. And there is another law: is uh, anti-money laundering, anti-terrorism, terrorism financing, and proceeds of unlawful activities act, or AMLA 2001. So this is after the 9/11. Um, this law is uh, in, is uh, legislated in many uh, countries throughout the world to combat uh, terrorism financing as well as money laundering, uh, which is a process to to legalize the illegal uh, income. And finally, Money Services uh, Business Act 2011. Uh, this is related to uh, institutions uh, that uh, deal with uh, money business like uh, currency exchange and others. So uh, the most uh, important law, as I said, the Central Bank 2009. So what was the key feature of that law was that uh, Islamic fi uh, is the first is yeah, it focuses on Islamic financial system that Bank Negara Malaysia will, uh, will practice a dual banking system or dual regulation. There will be Islamic financial institutions as well as the conventional uh, and uh, Bank Negara will uh, supervise both and they will go side by side. Second, there are uh, uh, very important uh, uh, clauses on the Sharia Advisory Council uh, of Bank Negara Malaysia as the highest authority. So, uh, the, uh, this, based on this law, the court or the uh, arbitrator, the judge, should refer to the Sharia Advisory Council of Bank Negara's resolution in, uh, when and they uh, handle any case. Uh, as you know, uh, the financial uh, issues uh, will go under the uh, under the civil court, it will not go to the Sharia court. So the civil lawyers, they are not well versed in sh Sharia matters or Islamic finance related issues. So they need to refer to the Sharia Advisory Council's resolution, written resolution, which is mandatory for them. 
And, uh, and the final important uh, feature of uh, Central Bank Act is uh, Malaysia International Islamic Financial Center. So this is uh, we call MIFC, which is actually uh, mandated to promote Islamic finance in uh, of Malaysia in the world uh, globally, uh, to in, uh, in order to make Malaysia as the hub for Islamic finance. So the MIFC is uh, is. Uh, Entrusted uh, to promote uh, Islamic finance in Malaysia, uh, to to market uh, Islamic finance as well as to uh, attract uh, foreign foreign investors to invest in Islamic finance in Malaysia. So uh, another important uh, act was uh, Islamic Financial Services Act. Uh, so this is a comprehensive uh, act uh, that provides the regulation and supervision of Islamic financial institutions, payment system, and other relevant entities. Uh, so this is uh, this law actually makes Malaysia a role model because it is a comprehensive law that gives very detail of uh, uh, of the transactions of the operation of Islamic financial institutions. So. And also it gives the oversight of Islamic money market, Islamic foreign exchange market to promote the financial stability and compliance with Sharia uh, and for related consequential or incident, uh, incidental matters. Uh, it's so, so it covers uh, the takaful in institutions, uh, is, uh, the banking, Islamic banking in institutions, and the financial advisors and others. So this is uh, uh, overall the contents of uh, IPSAT. So if you can see, uh, part four, uh, five, and six are quite related to uh, Islamic finance as well as Islamic wealth management. Uh, so uh, it's, it's, uh, part four talks about Sharia compliance, Sharia governance, Sharia audit. Part five, uh, pay, uh, what, uh, the payment system, the requirement, designation of payment system and Islamic payment instruments and requirement for operation of payment system as well as uh, issuance of designated Islamic payment instruments. So this is the payment instrument like, uh, you know, how we pay through the, the credit card or international transfer like uh, interbank transfer as well as uh, the e-wallet uh, and others. Uh, number six is the prudential requirements, uh, the standard requirements of our, our corporate governance uh, transparency requirements for auditors, appointed actuaries, as well as takaful funds uh, and shareholders and their subsidiaries. Uh, so the, uh, here also comes the governance for financial advisors. See, uh, the, in part 10, it also talks about Islamic money market and Islamic uh, foreign exchange market. And there are some other uh, parts. So we can see that it is a comprehensive law that covers everything uh, in, in, uh, in one. So this uh, law actually replaces the IBA, Islamic Banking Act 1983. Uh, so under this IFSA, the regulated the institutions uh, covered that will be regulated under IFSA are the Islamic banks, the takaful operators uh, and their operations, issuers of designated Islamic payment instruments like, pay, uh, as I said, the online payment like FPX uh, or the IBG uh, interbank uh, Giro, for example. So these are. Uh, uh, the rules and regulation are there. The takaful brokers as well as Islamic financial advisors, uh, what are the rules and regulations. Uh, and then uh, conventional institutions offering uh, Islamic uh, financial institutions like uh, um, uh, when the uh, uh, investment banker or as well as uh, the fund managers uh, convention of uh, uh, or, uh, for example, that uh, uh, the takaful uh, when the conventional uh, insurance when they use uh, have takaful, so that what should be the rules and regulations. So, what is the role of BNM on Islamic wealth management industry? Uh, we can see first they are the planner. 
they work through with uh, work together with the Securities Commission to develop Islamic finance in Malaysia. So they have a blueprint. Uh, Bank Negara they have a blueprint of uh, different for ten years. Uh, so they plan uh, how to develop the Islamic finance industry in Malaysia. That uh, to, to as we see they allow uh, at first uh, in Malaysia they start with one Bank Negara and then they allow. Uh, uh, Islamic windows and then they allow the foreign banks to come and all this happened because of they have a plan and blueprint so planning for the development of infrastructure planning for the development of even human resource so uh, that's uh, together with the Securities Commission Secondly, it supervises it, yes, it's uh, based on the Islamic uh, IFSA Islamic Financial Services Act 2013, uh, Bank Negara will issue license uh, to the financial advisors. It will regulate and supervise uh, all the wealth management firms, what you call the financial advisor, as well as other players like the Takaful institutions and other uh, financial institutions like investment banks and private banks. And finally, uh, BNM also has a contribution to develop uh, the human resource, which is development establishment of INSEF and ISRA. So INSEF is a is a only one university in the world which is uh, dedicated to, to only for the study of uh, Islamic finance, so that the wealth uh, managers, those who and they also have a module of Islamic wealth management as a comprehensive module. Uh, as well as uh, some other branches of knowledge in Islamic finance. Uh, together, ISRA also produces, uh, does research and produces books in the field of Islamic finance and wealth management. So now here I am again uh, just uh, recalling uh, what we have learned before on the requirement for financial advisors under Bank Negara. So here is the, the regulation for Bank Negara for financial advisors or wealth manage managers. Uh, so they should be licensed under the Insurance Act as a new category of intermediaries and they should have the wealth financial advisories, they must have a minimum capital of 100,000 and uh, it should be a Malaysian control, means the shareholders, majority of the shareholders should be Malaysian and they should have a minimum uh, professional indemnity insurance of 200,000, means in case of their breach uh, or their breach of trust, uh, this insurance can, can cover, so it should be at least 200,000. The license uh, will be renewed annually based on uh, if they fulfill the requirements set by Bank Negara. Um, and then the financial advisor is also subject to other requirements such as uh, changes in shareholding, approval for appointment of CEO and directors, opening of branches and submission of annual, uh, annual return. So all these, there is a rules under Bank Negara they need to follow, they need to inform and get approval for appointing the CEO and the directors. And the representatives of the FA who are basically who are the employees of the financial advisory firm or who are uh, uh, maybe the financial planner or wealth managers. So they also must be approved by BNM and have specific qualifications as required by BNM as uh, they should get uh, something like a Sharia financial planner certificate uh, to, in order to be financial advisor. And the word uh, finance dues, the word financial advisor is restricted only to those awarded the license. So here Bank Negara has become strict uh, for different professions to even sometimes insurance agents to call themselves a financial advisor. So here it is, um, uh, uh, it is prohibited. So now uh, comes to the, the Securities Commission Malaysia. So this is one of the regulators uh, in, related to wealth uh, of, uh, of management. And uh, so the Securities Commission gives regulation related to the, the issuance uh, of uh, suku uh, as well as the companies who want to issue shares. Uh, and so um, they also very much related to, to fund management companies or asset management companies that invest um, as well as the mutual funds that invest in the share markets or Islamic capital market. 
So this, uh, uh, the Securities Commission, uh, just uh, let me tell you a background of the Securities Commission before I talk about the Securities Commission Malaysia. So this uh, Securities Commission is a government department or an agency, sometimes it is a, a separate entities, which is responsible for financial regulation of security pro securities products, means financial assets. Uh, within a particular country. And the history of the Securities Commission is as long as there have been uh, uh, securities, there have been some kind of regulations. Uh, in the early days, this consisted uh, primarily of self-regulated groups or societies, like uh, external government regulation has primarily primarily been driven by financial crisis or scandal. So uh, at the beginning, uh, the rules and regulation were by certain societies uh, that they will have come out with some rules and regulations, like for the brokers themselves, they used to have some ethics to conduct. Uh, but after that, when there was breach and issues, then uh, the, of the Securities and Exchange Commission was established by the government. As, the, uh, as early as the 13th century, the King Edward I of England declared the brokers should be licensed. So that was, I think, one of the first uh, way of regulation. In seven, uh, 1720, the British Parliament passed the Bubble Act, which had specific regulation for securities. In the U.S., uh, the failure of the Blue Sky Law is a law related to security. And 1930 financial crisis and Great Depression. So there was a Great uh, Depression and financial crisis in 1930 in the U.S. and the whole world. So which led the government to pass legislation in 1934 to strengthen securities law and for the first time create a separate agency called the Securities and Exchange Commission in, in the U.S. in order to monitor the securities. In the early 1980s, as many countries deregulated their financial markets, they created specific government agencies to police the securities markets and stock exchanges. So in 1980s, when there was a liberalization, uh, well, uh, the promoting the, the financial markets to, to, to international investors. So they were deregulating, but at the same time, they were need to supervision and monitoring. So they established a new uh, security uh, market and uh, stock exchanges uh, to, to, to monitor uh, their, their operation. Uh, with the, however, with the advent of new financial products, it has been difficult to see uh, who has jurisdiction on those products. Sometimes uh, some of the products like uh, derivatives in instruments and even in the case of uh, some Islamic wealth management instruments, sometimes uh, it's, uh, there's overlapping with, uh, or sometimes there's confusion whether it comes under the jurisdiction of Securities Commission or, it, or the central bank. Uh, so there sometimes have some gap. Uh, so that is an issue, especially with the new uh, products like structure products or even some derivatives uh, instruments like futures and forwards. So the Securities Commission in Malaysia was established uh, in early 1993 as a self-funded uh, statutory body, government body, separate body entrusted with the responsibility to regulate and develop the Malaysian capital market, means uh, the Malaysian uh, sukuk market uh, as well as the share market. So the mission of uh, Securities Commission was to promote and maintain fair, efficient, secure and transparent securities and derivatives markets and facilitate the orderly development of an innovation and competitive capital market. So uh, again, the regulated, the, the role was to make sure uh, the system is safe, it is secure, there is no breach of trust by the comp firms or companies, by the brokers, as well as it is fair to all the investors, as well as the entrepreneurs, uh, the, the, the issuer of the securities, as well as the holders, uh, and also to, to promote the development especially the, uh, in the case of Malaysia, the development of Islamic capital market was very, it was crucial and it is not only for, uh, for the Securities Commission. Uh, 
So these are the, their responsibilities right now. They put in their websites to just in the summary. First, they to develop the overall capital market and its market segment. So to overall to develop the uh, the capital market in Malaysia and its segments like the share market, uh, like the bond market or the sukuk market, uh, as well as uh, mutual fund, uh, the Islamic, uh, the, uh, the fund management, as well as other uh, segments. So to, in order for them to develop and to, to have uh, also to trust, facilitating innovation and digital services throughout through the capital market. So it will facilitate and you know that it is a uh, Securities Commission also allowed the technology based uh, 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 technology base of uh, fi financial technology companies in in Malaysia, and it is also facilitating the the innovation. Uh, it's um, creating avenues for a sustainable financing ecosystem. So it is also. Uh, providing platform and facilitating uh, uh, the issuance of like green sukuk, uh, which are sustainable, um, and then ensuring proper conduct of all market participants through our supervisory surveillance and enforcement work. So, uh, uh, make sure that there is a proper conduct, uh, there is no breach of trust by the brokers, by the issuer. Uh, of the uh, of the uh, shares, uh, the the companies who who issue the shares as well as the issuer of bond, uh, so there is a proper conduct by all the parties to monitor and to have surveillance on them, and to give warning and take uh, uh, um, punitive uh, uh, measurement for those who violate the laws, and championing good corporate governance practices to ensure. Uh, good corporate governance among the firms, uh, among the uh, investment uh, uh, fund management institutions, asset and asset management institutions, and transparency, facilitating a greater cross-border regulatory cooperation and uh, uh, and thought uh, th uh, in through uh, in uh, leadership. So. Uh, uh, the Securities Commission is also uh, looking for international investors and as well as the cooperation uh, uh, and they also work together with uh, securities, uh, international uh, securities uh, com uh, uh, commission or organization in order to, to cooperate uh, the greater governance in, the, in this field as well as the leadership. Uh, especially, we can see their leadership in the field of is developing the Islamic uh, capital market, where they also have a Sharia compliance screening methodology that is uh, uh, that, uh, that actually showing uh, leadership for the development of uh, Sharia compliance share market in Malaysia. So. For Islamic wealth management industry, so the role of uh, the SCM is to promote and regulate all matters related to fund management. So, mostly about the fund management, which is one of the play fund managers, which are the one of the players of uh, of wealth management, including the unit trust and private retirement schemes uh, to regulate to monitor the investment to encourage and promote the development of the capital market in Malaysia, including research and training. So uh, Securities Commission, they have conduct research. They uh, also have periodic training. They, they require the Sharia advisors, for example, to go for training annually to in order for them to renew their license, as well as they have graduate training. It means, for example, uh, students of Bachelor of Islamic Finance or Islamic Wealth Management, they can do two years a training program with uh, under Securities Commission, and they have a very good program organized and they also give a good allowance uh, for those who are that their training um, so this is one of the contribution of uh, CM uh, as, as well as uh, they also um, issue license, register, authorize, approve, and supervise all persons engaging in regulated activities or providing capital market services. So all the, uh, the brokers, the mutual funds, um, all the firms which issue SUKU all need to uh, have in order to eat, get license or register and to, to get approval, they need to refer to the SCM. 
and to take all reasonable measures to monitor, mitigate, and manage systemic risks arising from the capital market. So in order uh, to, to make sure there is good corporate governance and in order to monitor the, the, fin uh, the financial markets, they will take necessary measures uh, to, to all the firms uh, and as well as all the uh, fund ma management companies and unit trust uh, organizations in order to monitor they will uh, come uh, as well as they have do other uh, mm, uh, job like uh, when there is a merger and acquisition uh, among the, the, the financial in institutions uh, so they, the Securities Commission also uh, has a, a role uh, on that. And uh, the, there is also a Sharia Advisory Council okay, uh, under the Securities Commission Malaysia. Well, uh, there is one Sharia Advisory Council uh, with the Bank Negara Malaysia, as, uh, and then there is another Sharia Advisory Council in the Securities Commission Malaysia, and that was established in 1996, and they also actually one of the... the uh, they played very important role for the development of Islamic capital market in Malaysia and they uh, are responsible for issuing the, right now a list of Sharia compliance securities. So Securities Commission will every six months will update the list of Sharia compliance shares in their website. So today uh, SC provides for Sharia compliant investors the list of Sharia compliance securities, uh, the Sukuk, uh, Islamic unit trust, uh, Sharia indices, so the index, uh, uh, you know, the, they will track the performance of the Sharia compliant shares, uh, the Sharia compliant share market. So they, there are some Sharia compliant indices uh, in, under the, uh, the Bursa Malaysia. And then Islamic uh, uh, derivatives instruments, the issuance as well as approval. So they will give uh, advisory services. So these are the th there are three laws uh, that um, uh, that uh, uh, support uh, the the operation of Securities Commission Malaysia, which is uh, Capital Market and Services Act 2007, uh, and earlier there was Securities Commission Act 19 uh, 1993. So I, th I believe this is also replaced by the uh, uh, Capital Market and Services Act 2007. As, uh, and then there was uh, Securities Industry Central Depositories Act, uh, Depository Act uh, 1991. So let's look into the uh, Capital Market and Services Act 2007. So what was the key feature? The first, uh, okay, the first thing that it gives mandate to SCM to encourage and promote the development of the securities and future markets in Malaysia. So its role was to mandate, to develop, to market uh, the Malaysian, Islamic, uh, Malaysian capital market. And then a more focused approach in developing Islamic capital market industry in Malaysia. As you know that in, Isla, in, the, in, Isla, in the capital market, there are almost 100% instruments are Sharia compliant. So they, they are, they, the, the SCM were focused and they're mandated, same like Bank Negara Malaysia, they are also uh, had a mission to develop the Islamic capital market uh, in Malaysia with the issuance uh, of, uh, with the um, uh, Sharia compliant uh, share screening, suku, uh, as we know that Malaysia is the, is the top in terms of the suku uh, issuance uh, in the world. Uh, so that was done uh, through the effort of the SCM and their Sharia Advisory Council. And they are also developing infrastructure for Islamic capital market. Uh, so they are providing support, research and training. They are developing the human resource uh, as, uh, as well as uh, they are also uh, giving training to the Sharia advisors in order to understand the market better. So here I'm just again recalling uh, what are the um, uh, Securities Commission's guidelines uh, uh, regarding the uh, um, uh, Islamic uh, fund managers. Uh, so if uh, a company, a fund management company, wants to be registered as Islamic fund management, what are the requirements? 
So first is appointment of a registered Sharia advisor. So there are a there is a list of registered Sharia advisor under the uh, Securities Commission Malaysia's website. So the fund management company needs to choose one of the registered Sharia advisor in order to supervise their investment. Appointment of, uh, and as well as there should be a compliance officer, which is uh, like a full-time Sharia officer, which uh, well versed in Islamic fund management as well as the com conventional fund management, and must ensure that its investment activities are limited to Sharia compliant investment. Uh, and sh if there is non-Sharia compliant in uh, income, they should immediately purify their income and should always maintain all their accounts in the Islamic financial institutions as well as if they have insurance they need to insure with uh, they need to actually should take takaful and uh, if uh, should uh, if Islamic fund management companies need to take undertake uh, appropriate sharia approved risk management techniques so uh, before the um, uh, Sharia violation happen, before the Sharia non-compliance even occurs, uh, the fund management needs, a company needs to have proper risk management techniques uh, in order to stop those violations. There should be a written disclosure and declaration. Means at the end of the uh, at the end of the year, they must uh, the Sharia advisor must declare and disclose that all of the investment are Sharia compliant. If there was any, um, uh, if there was any uh, uh, non-halal income, it was purified. They must do that. Should have internal audit, uh, the Sharia auditors as well, uh, to to ensure uh, that there is no uh, Sharia violation. Similarly, must engage the Islamic account, uh, segregates, uh, the must keep separate the Islam, uh, Islamic accounts. Uh, if uh, some kind of mutual fund, for example, like public mutual, they have both conventional and Islamic, so they must make sure there is a segregation of fund, and they must make sure the Islamic fund does not mix with the conventional. And finally, I'll be giving talking on one important uh, also financial services authority, even though it's not a major one, but it is also important, which is uh, Lab One Financial Services Authority. So it was uh, it in the past it used to be called a Lab One Offshore. Uh, um, okay, however, they have uh, changed the name to. Lab One Financial Services Authority. So, uh, it is uh, one of the uh, financial authority. Uh, however, it is only its operation is only with the jurisdiction of, uh, of Lab One, as Lab One was. Uh, yeah, so, it, this uh, financial uh, services authority was established in Lab One so that to make uh, you know to develop Lab One as an international business and financial center, same like uh, Hong Kong, uh, Luxembourg, or Singapore. Uh, so, uh, so uh, this kind of like offshore uh, business uh, uh, jurisdiction, it gives some kind of special facilities to the uh, to the uh, people uh, to do business. They are usually very conducive to business as well as the promote the, 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 the tourism of that sector as well as give some kind of uh, tax uh, relief uh, those who want to do business there. So uh, it was established in 1996 as a single regulatory body to promote and develop Lab One as an international business and financial center, and also to support the development of the island as, and to pay an effective complementary role to the domestic financial market. So uh, it also had, uh, uh, played a role to develop uh, the domestic market. So their role and uh, function uh, is to uh, conduct uh, business development and promotion, uh, supervise business uh, and financial activities, develop national uh, objective policies and set priorities, administer and enforce legislation to issue license and then to register Lab One offshore companies. So it is to, to promote Lab One as an international center. So they do, they regulate, uh, it's a kind of uh, something like uh, Bank Nagara. They will uh, uh, 
uh, monitor, they will issue license, but at the same time, uh, they also promote uh, Labuan as, uh, as uh, a tourist uh, place and they attract uh, international companies to have open office there uh, as well as uh, they open their, their branches in, in Labuan. Uh, so, that's, uh, so that's all on this uh, topic. So for further reading, please uh, read the book on ISRA and refer to the website of Securities Commission Malaysia and Bank Negara Malaysia. So with that, uh, I thank you. If you have any question, you can ask me in the uh, comment section. Okay, with that, uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.